of this album, being Americana. Right. Well, the the theme of the record was something that just kind of came about <clears throat> as uh, as the songs were being written. It wasn't something that was really a, a conscious goal. Um, as we started to look at the different songs, we kind of realized that each song was a different illustration of, uh, of examples of American culture. So when Dexter came up with the title Americana, you know, he was looking at that. He was realizing that that there were uh, these songs were just kind of forming up that way. Um, you know, whether it was a song like Get a Job about people living off other people or um, the kids aren't all right, or or pretty fly, walla walla, were all examples of people that we knew growing up in American American culture. I don't think it's specifically limited to to America, but but um, you know, as Americans growing up, it's something that <clears throat> these are examples that we're all pretty familiar with. The other thing about American culture, and you, which you've addressed, is the talk show phenomenon. Right. And that's also, I mean, Australia had, gets all the American talk shows. You guys get Springer? Yeah. Oh, yeah. lucky you guys. See, we only export the best, the best that American culture has to offer. <laughs> Right, yeah, I mean, when we when we watch these shows, it's just, I mean, it's ridiculous. It's, it's you know, on one, you know, one hand, it's horrifying that, that there's people out there that will, that will do all the things that these people do on the show, and then let alone come on TV and talk about it, you know, but then on the other hand, it's also these people aren't all that different from guys I went to school with, you know, women that I worked with, the girl next door, the guy up the street, you know, these are all pretty close to the people that I know. Most of the people I know don't go on TV and talk about their problems, but so it's just kind of turning into this this circus almost, this uh, circus. So, Do you think it comes from the, you know, everyone wants the 15 minutes theory? Or I, I think that, yeah, and, and I think also there's a lot of people that just feel disenfranchised. They have no power to change their life, and and people on TV have power, you know, and, and have fame. And, and and so I think that people are people are looking for something to give their life meaning and worth and and all that, yeah. So, the, so I think that's why the talk shows... I mean, and, and they appeal to the least common denominator, really, of, of our culture, you know, or whoever's culture the, the talk show happens to be well, you've, about. You've had more than your 15 minutes. How do you feel about fame in general and all the bullshit that you Right, I mean, what is, I was talking, I had this conversation with my daughter the other day, and she says, you're lucky, you're, you're famous, you're lucky, and I said, you really think so? I said, you... You know, and most people probably do, and, and I would really want to argue about that, but I was trying to make the point that with the, the higher numbers of people that know me, there's a higher number of people that, that like me and appreciate what I do. There's also a higher number of people that don't know me but hate my guts and think that I'm, you know, whatever, a corporate sellout or <clears throat> whatever they choose to think about me. And so I was explaining this to my daughter, you know, about all these people that don't know me but don't like me. She says, oh, well, forget about those people. <laughs> you know? So she's eight, <laughs> and of course I think she's brilliant. But I, I thought she pretty much nailed it on the head. Forget about those people, because you know they really don't know me. The the flip side of that is all the people that don't know me and and really, you know, think I'm something. They don't know me either. So you know that's all kind of a bunch of BS too. The people that just appreciate the music, you know, that's that's where it's at. That's what we're what we're doing this for. It gets kind of. That's why we were really kind of careful to not hype up who we are and where we came from and everything when Smash was really kind of busting loose. We wanted to keep it just about about the music and just about the music on Smash. We didn't want to make it about a musical movement. We didn't want to make it about um, individual personalities in the band and, and stuff like that. We just wanted to try to keep it low key and just make it about the music. Is it, um, the criticism that you have got, do you think that stem, stems from jealousy or? Well, I, I think from a lot of things, sure, jealousy is one, one thing. But, um, when you see a band that you don't particularly care for get a large amount of fame, you know, why? You know, that used to bother me more than anything. I used to hate Bruce Springsteen because I could never understand why was he so popular. He was so mediocre, so middle of the road to me. This was, you know, when I was hugely into punk rock and, you know, all things that weren't punk rock sucked pretty much. <laughs> you know, I've relaxed, I've relaxed my, my ideas about that a little bit, but... But I still I see people on the radio that I just don't think are deserving of what they've gotten. A lot of people could level those criticisms at us, and who might argue with that? <laughs> so, um, I mean, in your bio it says you're still punk at heart. Do you agree with that? Well, yeah. I mean, you know, our uh, 
our experiences, you know, over the last 15, 20 years have been with a type of music, really, and a, and a scene, you know, that, that has meant, I mean, it's really kind of came in and, and it was something that we held as our own. This is what helped us grow up. It gave us, it, it gave us, um, you know, it just gave us a place to be. It gave us a home, really. You know, when we were, you know, growing up, and the only music really happening was was uh, was like right at the end of disco, and the only rock music was just really arena rock, the Van Halens and the Ario Speedwagons, and then came the whole glam thing after that. It was just that didn't appeal to me, and that was the stuff that was popular with most of my contemporaries, and I hated that. I thought it was a bunch of crap. You know, I liked the Sex Pistols and the Dickies and and Iggy Pop, and all this stuff seemed to be a little bit more real to me. Do you sort of get sick of the fact that, because I know Rage Against the Machine, I know they're different to your music, but the same type of thing where once they became successful, people were sort of saying, well, how can you be socialists or punks or whatever? Does that sort of get a bit old for you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think, well, first of all, yeah, I mean, I don't want to... I'm, a, I'm not a huge Rage Against the Machine fan, but I do like what they stand for. I think it's great, and they certainly reach a lot more people, you know, selling records the way they do. I mean, for them, I think the record label is just a channel for getting the music to the kids as far as how they make music and, and how they tour and do all that stuff. That's, that's up to them, and they do a lot of other things, you know, as individuals. Um, besides just making records. I think I think they're a great band. I think that, that they get the message to the most kids the, the best way possible. But the fact that, I'm just saying, I'm just drawing a similarity that how can you be a punk and have all this money and great lives? Right. Well, if, if I mean, if somebody's going to make, I mean, if this music's going to make money, the music that we make is going to make money, it would be stupid not to not to get our fair share of it and just let it go to to whatever record label, whether it's an independent record label or a, or you know a corporate label. Um, you know, I'm not going to apologize for. You know, first of all, punk rock means never having to say you're sorry, but I'm not going to apologize for for making money. It's not. It was not my intention. It was not my aim when I got into this. You know, and, and it would have been absurd to think that. I mean, it was absurd to think that punk rock was ever going to make money. That was just absurd at the time. It was always hated. It was never, you know, I got beat up in high school for being into punk rock. So to think that that was going to make money is just ridiculous. You know, the fact that it has, I think, is, is kind of a, well, I don't think it's a fluke so much anymore. In hindsight, <clears throat> I think it's easier to say, you know, there was just certain uh, barriers that kind of broke, you know, broke, uh, broke open and, and allowed for mainstream acceptance of punk rock. But at the at the time, you couldn't foresee that happening. But what about creatively? Isn't it harder to... I mean, you're not obviously not starving musicians anymore. Is it? Is it harder to be creative when it, I guess... Well, you've got more writing on it in one sense, but you don't in another. You know, I don't, I don't think so. We never really wrote songs about... You know, we didn't write songs like We're Desperate by the, you know, like X's song or <laughs> Desperate. And X used to get that question, you know, when they were selling out shows at the Whiskey. <laughs> you know, how can you write songs called We're Desperate when you're actually making money as a punk band? You know, I, you, it's not hard. It's not hard to find things that, that you care about, things that, that things that are painful, things that are fun, things that, things that make you laugh, you know, things that, that piss you off. It's, I don't think... Uh, Having money ever is going to change that. Can you talk a bit about Australia? How many times have you been there now? Three times, and and that's that's my favorite place to tour. Um, it's just everyone's really nice to us. Um, I love the ocean. I love being near the ocean. And everywhere we've been in Australia is all about the ocean. Um, it's just a great country. It's so wide open. You know, there's it's such a small population for this huge, huge landmass. Um, very, but at the same time, Australians are very ecologically minded, you know, really kind of have a lot of concern for, for, for just the, the land that they live off of. And I think that's awesome. Um, I've also got to surf when I've been there. I've got to do some fishing when I've been there. Um, just, do you have a favorite place there? Um, not really. There's a, a couple of places. I got to. Um, we got to spend a week at Byron Bay one time. Well, like four days at Byron Bay, and that was gorgeous. That was really beautiful. I got to surf Torquay, which was nice. So also there was a place in New Zealand, right outside of Auckland, where I got to go surfing. That was just a beautiful, beautiful beach. 
Are you, do you plan on touring there? Obviously you are. Yeah, we'll be back. Yeah, definitely. Do you know yeah. when? Uh, you know what I don't. I'm thinking it's going to be like May or June, I believe. Now, can you tell me about um, Idle Hands? Yeah, yeah. Idle Hands was a was a movie that hit us up to to play a part. Um, actually, what we're doing is we're just playing a band that's that's playing the high school dance, and uh, our singer gets his scalp ripped off by this hand, this severed hand that's running around terrorizing all the teenagers, and it's just this comedic horror film. It looks really really goofy and it's not very serious and and I think it might go straight to video but uh, it was a lot of fun for us to do it was kind of like an extended video shoot you know um, one of the people I first got to meet was um, this, this uh, guy named Seth Green who's the, an actor and he was Scott Evil uh, and um, Austin Powers are you familiar with Austin Powers <laughs> yeah he played Scott Evil and and that was one of my favorite movies, Austin Powers. So to meet Scott was that was rad for me. <laughs> so he's one of the guys in the in this movie. But it was really just a lark. I mean, none of us have agents, and we don't expect to be going Hollywood anytime soon. Are you a fan of those sort of teenage horror movies? Not really. No, I think they're they're usually they just kind of bore me. They're either you know there's rarely a good horror film that really kind of does its job for me. Uh, one example would be like The Exorcist I thought was great. Um, you know, things like that, but but usually they don't they don't do me. The the comedic ones are a little more tolerable, you know, cuz they make fun of that whole genre. So so you're not, so you're not sort of actively looking for any more roles. <clears throat> no, no. I mean if you know if, if others came our way, I don't think we'd you know, if it was fun and, and along similar lines as this, we might do it again. But you know, we're not no, we're not looking to be movie stars. I think that would be we'd fail miserably. I think. A lot so. of um, your appeal as a band is the fact that you you don't sort of put yourself up on a pedestal. Is that a conscious thing on your heart? Uh, I, I think that's just kind of really where where we are. I mean, yeah, we we do try to. You know, with the, with the first band, you know, as I mentioned before, we did try to kind of stay out of the press and not make it about individual personalities with this thing. It's just keep it about the music. Um, but also, I think we're basically pretty, just pretty shy people. And, you know, I mean, we think you know, we think the world of what we do. We think what we do is very worthwhile, you know, you know musically. And, and when we get out and play shows, I think we put on a great show. Um, but you sort of don't go into big rock star. No, kind of, that's kind of right, and that's kind of coming from the scene we came from. You know, that kind of stuff was just, you know, the rock stars were just despised, and we made fun of them. It'd be stupid for us to all of a sudden start trying to live that. Not that, not that we haven't at times. You know, there's times when you can't avoid kind of doing the, whatever the smashing hotel rooms, drunk and on an airplane brawl kind of thing, you know. Um, but we try not to, you know, try not to, like one scene is we try not to work the groupie scene. That's just, I, th I think it's kind of cheesy. Is still a big scene? No, actually it's not as big as it, as it apparently was like in the 70s and 80s, uh, which I think is good. I think it's kind of dehumanizing for everybody involved, you know. So, and most of you married or girlfriends? Yeah. Married and or girlfriends. What about, say, like the, the whole myth of, you just talked talk about the sex part, the, the drugs and the whole scene? Um, fortunately, none of us, any, any kind of drug problems we've had, we had before we were well off enough to afford a real problem, <laughs> you know. Um, you know, we went through all that and, and have had our experiences, but aside from alcoholism <laughs> we don't really have a, a big chemical dependency problems in the band so are you um, sort of conscious about working out or are you very healthy you know? no I try I usually play too much guitar to lately to bother with working out you know I do things like snowboard and, and surf and things like that and those are funner ways of trying to stay physically in shape so just getting back to like the album and the songwriting process and the recording process, is do you have a set process or the sort of how, how does it come together? Yeah, more or less Dexter writes writes pretty much everything, lyrics and music. But he, he goes off and, and he'll 
he'll get songs at least close to being done, and he'll bring them into the studio, and then we'll we'll change songs around. Um, lyrics usually aren't done until the basic tracks are recorded, and actually until everything's recorded, and he starts to sing them. That's when lyrics are usually done. He'll have like three or four songs written lyrically before we enter the studio, and then everything else evolves after that. And he'll discuss that with, with all of us, different ideas, and and uh, we'll offer suggestions as far as that goes. I think musically is where where the band does most of its... Uh, of its alterations, you know, Ron and Greg and I all have suggestions about how to do do, do things differently, or you know, things that we could add to a song, things that aren't working in a song that we need to take out. But it's primarily Dexter as a songwriter. So, who sort of collectively were your musical influences as, as a band? As a band, really, the stuff that we all love and, and that ties us all together is the California punk stuff um, from from late '70s into the into the early '80s. Uh, bands like the Adolescents, Agent Orange, TSOL, Social Distortion, um, Dead Kennedys, and then a lot of other stuff. You know, we're all big Ramones fans. Um, not, not a whole lot of English bands. The Sex Pistols, of course, is you know a big influence on us as any punker. <laughs> but uh, but not you know like there was the real political and and the exploited kind of scene, and none of us really got into that too much. We were aware of it and listened to it, but it wasn't as big an influence. So mostly just California stuff. What about contemporary bands? Yeah, this it's kind of yeah we're all kind of varied as far as what we like um, now. Greg's not a big music fan, so I don't know. <laughs> we had this discussion. We did a photo shoot. We're like, Greg, what was the last CD you bought? God, I think it was Dookie, <laughs> the, the Green Days. Um, so we're all big fans of Green Day. I mean, there's really they're great. I think a great live band, and at least on the uh, you know on the bigger venue scale, there's nobody that puts on a better live show than than Green Day, except for maybe Kiss, but I haven't seen it yet. So. Are you gonna see it? Uh, you know what I'd like to, but but I've got my daughter that weekend that they're playing here, and I'm taking her to a Halloween party, so I'm gonna miss it here. Maybe I'll catch them out of town somewhere. Can you imagine having a career as long as kids? No, <laughs> I'm not gonna say that it won't happen, but I can't imagine it. You know, I mean, I we signed a deal. You know, two years ago we signed a deal for for four records, and and we've got probably another three three years on that deal. Um, from this point, and I, I can't see beyond that. To me, that was looking far off into the future. We've never been a band that looks beyond, you know, where if we're making a record, that's the end of our vision. To, let's get this record done. And then once the record's done, then we look at touring, you know, and then we look at that touring schedule, and, you know, usually we don't look beyond six months. What do you do to sort of relieve the boredom on the road? Um, Nintendo. Nah, yeah. Um, Gotta look. Really, we all do different things. Ron actually is into that kind of stuff, the Nintendo stuff. But he's also really into. He brings out like these little micro composer kind of things, all these little mini uh, instrumental like recording things. He's really into the recording engineering kind of stuff, and so he does a lot of stuff like that. Um, I just play a lot of guitar on the road lately. That's really all I do. And then Dexter will do some stuff. Um, he, I think he's on the phone organizing things at his label at Nitro, <laughs> taking care of that. And I don't know what Greg does, crossword puzzles. So does that conflict with you at all, the fact that he has this label? No, not at all. Um, actually, he put out our first record. Right, well, I mean, the band would conflict more with the label, you know, that he definitely puts Offspring first over the label. Um, but when he's at home, he goes to the, he's at, he's at Nitro at his office pretty much daily, you know, and he calls in pretty much daily from the road. Um, when we were recording, I think he just tried to go in maybe once a week, in the, you know, maybe a couple times a week in the morning before we'd go to the studio just to kind of oversee things. But he's hiring pe more and more people to kind of let that run by itself. You know, people that people that have, you know, feel similarly about the music scene and about music and, and can make some decisions, you and know, without this, him having to be there. Is this all based in Orange County? Yeah. How, why? Why? Why Orange County? Yeah. It's just because it's where we grew up. It's where we, where we call home. It's where we're comfortable. Um, I think the music scene here in Orange County is more alive than, than it ever, ever was before. Um, 
as far as how creative and original is it, I don't, I, you know, I, I couldn't say. I think well, there's always things coming out of Orange County, though. I was really thinking more along the lines of the logistics of, you know, a business, not, not really the creative side. Right. Well, see, fortunately, you know, when, I, you know, when you're... You're not really that far, though. So. Right, from L.A., you know, where, the, where there's a big hub. But for, for the level that uh, Nitro operates on, Orange County is great. Really, I mean, it's Nitro is just a real focused independent label, and it's focused on getting getting the the records to the the type of fan that would enjoy that kind of music. And are you all um, sort of active as far as I don't know in an A and R way, or even in a casual? Uh, like I heard this great band, he's just taped up. Sure, sure, yeah. I mean, yeah, we'll always make suggestions to Dexter. He's really. You know, he doesn't sign a whole lot of bands, but, but I'll make suggestions, you know, if I hear of a band, to go check them out. You know, usually that happens when we're, when we're playing local shows. We try to get local bands to open for us, bands that we, that we all care about. I really recently just pushed for this band called The Pushers to open up for us. Um, they're a great local band. Um, and actually, Dexter had already, Dexter's already kind of clued in on them and, uh, and was into that. Um, but yeah, we all we all do that a little bit, as well as, as a lot of our friends send him tapes, you know. Stormy, our booking agent, is always sending him stuff. She's always sending us stuff, too, bands that send things in that would like to go out on tour with us in a, in a support slot. So are you very sort of hands-on with your career as far as the business side? Have you seen Bruce have clued up? Um, you know, I think that was an education that we really got... Um, when we were negotiating with with Epitaph right after Smash, it was just kind of a sink or swim type of education. It's not something that I ever really wanted to learn about, or still really care to learn about. Except that at the time, it was it was my my life that was really, you know, weighed in the balance. Not that I was going to die if if we didn't strike a great deal, but it, you know, this is what I love to do. Um, you know, I was scared that I was going to have to stop doing it, maybe. But does it worry you that if you're not sort of hands-on, you may get ripped off? Sure, sure, yeah, and yeah, ex same thing. You know, you have to, you have to be on top of that. I've got a few sort of inane type of questions. Okay. All right. Hopefully, I can come up with some inane answers. <laughs> What's the best and worst thing about being an offspring? Hmm. Yeah, the, let's start with the bad. Um, the worst thing, I guess, would have to be just kind of, you know, I don't know. I'm, I wouldn't trade this for the world. What I do, I got to preface all this by saying that I don't want to come across as complaining about my position. Oh, poor little rock star, you know. <laughs> I don't think there's anything worse in the world than somebody whining. Um, How do you, just on that subject for one second, you know, like Smashing Pumpkins, I mean, you know, they're always whining. Right, right. So how, do you, what do you think when you hear that sort of stuff? I, I try to tune it out, especially if it's a band that I that I like artistically, like the Smashing Pumpkins, I think that, that they've got some great things going for them. I really admire Billy Corrigan as a, as a uh, songwriter and as a, as a guitar player, and he's, he's fabulous. So... You know, when I hear him whining, I just go, all right, whatever. Um, what <laughs> so I had to listen. You what know, you same with, like, Pearl Jam or whoever, or Kurt Cobain, Nirvana. What about Courtney Love? What do you think of her album? Um, you know what? I haven't heard enough of it to make a judgment, but I like Courtney. I think she's I think she's, I think she's, awesome. I think she's got a lot of energy and a lot of power and a lot of angst and, and stuff. This record's not as angry as a lot of the other stuff. So, um, but you know her whole... Um, She's now upset that she's so famous where she's gone out of her way to come that way. Right. In the same vein as Billy Corgan bitching about... Is she whining about being famous now? Yeah, really? Oh, well, whatever. She's okay. she's never been, you know, she's never been a model of sanity, I don't think. <laughs> I don't think she's going to begin anytime soon, regardless of, you know, how many Gucci dresses she wears and whatever. So getting back to the best and the worst. Yeah, so I, you know, I don't want to come across like I'm whining, but but uh, you know, we do get asked because of where we come from. You know, the, the whole punk rock thing. I think that that uh, our intentions are questioned a lot more than maybe you know maybe other bands. You know, that, that 
that are out. Um, and I just think that's, I don't know. I, you know, I understand that people want to know, is, is your heart really with the music? Well, I think come to one of our shows, you know, and, and find out, is it really where, where it's at? And I think, you'll, I think you'll find out that, yeah, most nights it is. <laughs> so that's, that's the worst thing. Just some of the questions, the sellout, the whole sellout thing, and the whole, you know, you can't be punks because of this. And, and to me, punk rock was never about limits. So, you know, for me not to run with this and see how far we could take this thing, that would have been stupid. You know, it would have been stupid to let it all pass. I think we should take this as far as it, as it goes, see where, where the limits lie. Um, what do you steal from, uh, oh no, hang on, what's the best thing? Mm. Best thing is, uh, <clears throat> ah, just I, uh, getting out there and playing every night, really, and, be, and being able to go to new places and do it, you know, where the fans are new and, the, and they're excited about it. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing that beats that feeling of coming out and, and having people sing along you know and you just hear them just in a roar in unison that's rad so and, and we're lucky in that we get to do some of the you know some of the bigger venues um and some big festivals which are just insane just insane amount of energy and then we also get to go do some small clubs you know um, we're not i don't think i don't think we're ever going to be limited to one one size venue or the other do you remember where you were the first time you heard yourself on radio yeah yeah um it was a long time ago, and there's a, a local station, Caro Q, and they had this uh, this guy Rodney on the Rock, and he actually played something off our first record. I think he played Out on Patrol, off our first record. It was late at night, and um, I'm crashing. I got to get up and go to work early Monday morning, and somebody calls me on the phone, turn on K-Rock, and I turn it on and catch the last half of of one of our, of our songs. And that was probably like 1990 when I heard that, so like almost 10 years ago. So what were you doing? What jobs did you have? I was a janitor at a at an elementary school. Um, Greg worked at a blueprint shop. Ron worked at a muffin shop, and Dexter was uh, uh, he was dealing drugs in Watts. <laughs> <laughs> so when were you all able to give up your day jobs? Uh, I quit. I was the last one to quit, and I I quit in June of '94. I finished out our our record came out and. Um, was it May, April, or May of '94? I don't even remember. Smash came out, and we were already—it was already getting radio play. The, the single came out and play. It was getting radio play, and we were, had plans to get out and tour. And I told my boss that I'd finish out the school year, and then, uh, and then take off. And and she was great. She let me go off, take some like Fridays and Mondays off for extended weekends, so we could go out and play shows like like that. And. Uh, that was that was it. June '94 was the last time any of us held a real job. Dex, Dexter's, I should say, the Dexter now. I, I showed up at Nitro the other day and we're talking, and he holds up this application for McDonald's. He says, "Noodles, dude, you got to get a job with me at McDonald's." <laughs> he wants to get a job at McDonald's. He really does. He had this application halfway filled out, and I'm like, "Oh no way, dude, no way." I actually worked at McDonald's. That was like my first real job when I was 16. And I won't go back. <laughs> you, you can't make me go week? back. Well, only with my daughter. Only when she... And it's actually the same one where I worked at usually. It's over by my by, by where she goes to school, where she lives with her mother. Where did you get your nickname from? It's from noodling on guitar. Actually, Tom Wilson, um, the producer on the first three records, uh, named me that when we were doing the first record, just because I was always noodling. and He had to clean up the, the tapes because <laughs> there would just be this... Excess guitar noise. Uh, what do you steal from hotel rooms? What do I steal from hotel rooms? Uh, I don't usually steal anything, but but I've I've been known to to cause damage in other ways, and <laughs> so it's usually just me. But I, no, I don't really. <laughs> I don't really want to elaborate on that. Um, when this is a you know way out question, when was your first sexual experience? Oh wow. Um, you mean as a band? <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean as an individual. <laughs> and I was 14. Was it, was it a good or a bad? No, oh, it was bad. Yeah, it was bad. Do you still know who, do you still know I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't a rape or anything, but, um, no, I don't. I, we've lost touch. But yeah, it was, it was just bad. It was just, I was too nervous and... Um, 
I don't think it happened for either of us. So. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, are you going out with someone now? Well, I'm married. I just got. Uh, yeah, I got married in in February. So there's three of us now that are married. Um, Greg got married last September, and Dexter got married a couple years ago, and Ron's the last holdout. So, but your daughter's obviously. From a previous, yeah, from a previous relationship. I was never married before. So how would you feel if your daughter followed in your footsteps? As far as music, as far as career. Oh, as far as a career, you know that I would, I would support her. I'd, I'd want her to know that you know what happened to me is. is kind of a fluke, at least in terms of commercial success. I mean, I don't think it's a fluke that we're a good band and we go out there and, and, and play great shows. I think that's who we are, but I think that a lot of the commercial success that we got on Smash is really kind of a fluke. I don't think you can orchestrate something like that. Because there are a zillion <coughs> just as talented people exactly. in the You know, I look at bands like the Dickies, who are one of my favorite bands, and I think have always put on a great show and have always put out great records, you know, and why haven't they had some of the success that, that I've had, even some of the success that I've had, and they have had success to a certain degree, but, but not, not a whole lot and not as much as I would give them if, if I were the one who said, you're famous, you're not. So do you ever sort of think why me? Sure, sure, that was a, you know, that's something you just kind of kind of let go of, but at first, yeah, you know, when, you know, when this first happened to us and we're making... You know, we're making money doing something that we've been doing for 10 years and, and cost us money to do the, the previous 10 years. I mean, we'd save up money so that we could afford to go out on tour. It was just what we love to do. You know, why now? Why, why us? Sure, it was something that you just, you know, we kind of grappled with for a while.